The World Cup is coming to town. A massive soccer event held every four years is one of the biggest sporting events in the world. After a qualification phase, 32 teams will compete in the tournament until one hoists a championship trophy. The event is watched by over half a billion people every time, with the final match being watched by more than 1 in 10 people around the globe in 2018. That's a massive draw, to say nothing of the masses of fans who will be lucky enough to watch it in person. So clearly it's a great honor to host it, and countries must be lined up to compete for the right. Wrong. Hosting the World Cup is a tricky affair that fewer and fewer countries are interested in these days. It's a massive financial investment, it's not clear if it'll pay off in the long run, and many countries aren't set up for it, so this year the World Cup is being hosted in Qatar, a small but wealthy country on the Arabian Peninsula. It gained the privilege after an extensive lobbying campaign, and this put that little-known country into the public eye for the first time for many people. But this exposure wasn't purely positive, because the Qatari World Cup might be the most controversial in the history of the sport. For one thing, the event is being held in November for the first time ever, as it's usually held in the summer. This is because Qatar gets brutally hot during the summer. It's a desert nation near the equator, after all. Attempting to host it during the summertime would have likely resulted in many athletes and spectators passing out from heat stroke. Even in November, the temperature is unlikely to dip below 79 degrees Fahrenheit during day matches, a brutal prospect for athletes. This not only means a challenging schedule for the World Cup, it affects the ongoing European league running at the same time. And there are other major issues with the new host country. Qatar is ostensibly a constitutional monarchy. Political freedoms are limited and the laws are highly restrictive. The country maintains a strict ban on homosexuality, and former FIFA head Sepp Blatter once advised that gay fans and players should avoid sexual activity when visiting. Additionally, Qatar is infamous for having a massive population of temporary workers, many of whom operate in dangerous conditions. Reportedly, at least 6,500 migrant workers have died since the hosting rights of the World Cup was awarded to Qatar. Why are they working so hard? Because Qatar doesn't have a soccer infrastructure. The country doesn't have a long history of soccer, so they don't have any stadiums capable of hosting massive World Cup matches. It's estimated it'll cost over $200 billion to build the hotels, stadiums, and other facilities needed to pull off this World Cup, which is almost a hundred times what it cost other countries like South Africa to prepare for their World Cup. So with all these problems, why is the event happening in Qatar? Because almost everyone else shook their heads and backed away slowly. On paper, hosting the World Cup has a lot of advantages. You're bringing in a massive tourist audience, and if they have a good time, they might come back for future sporting events or just to tour the area. You'll be doing a lot of business in foreign trade as well, as countries will want to be represented there. And that doesn't include the domestic boom. Even the most soccer-crazy countries will need a lot of new infrastructure, because the stadiums that host local play just aren't big enough for World Cup matches. And that means a lot of construction and a lot of new jobs for the working stiffs, probably with a lot of overtime. So what's the downside? Well, it turns out, a lot. For one thing, as much as seems the governments just print money, there is a limit to what they can draw from the treasury, and the discretionary spending needed to outfit a country for the World Cup can far outstrip that annual budget. That means that countries often need to get into debt to set themselves up, and then they need to hope that the boost in tourism that they get from the World Cup will offset it. Will it work? Well, the more expensive that setup part is, the less likely it is the country will make its money back, which means the Qatar might be in for a rude awakening in 2023. But hey, at least they're left with permanent improvements, right? This is true, but only to a point. The many hotels and housing facilities that are built for the World Cup will be useful after the event, but only if the country sees a boost in its tourism sector after the event. This is a great resource that countries that already have a thriving tourism sector can benefit from. But countries that don't experience a high level of tourism will see these hotels stay mostly empty until another big event comes to town. And then there are the stadiums, massive beasts, that often find themselves mostly empty and degrading in the years after the World Cup, with no matches of this size likely to be played in the country again. Some use them to host national matches anyway, no matter how awkward the empty seats are. And the less infrastructure a country has, the more challenging it becomes. Qatar is the most extreme of cases, and the amount it spends on the World Cup is almost five times the total amount spent by every other country who's hosted the World Cup since 1990 combined. But every country faces financial challenges when they host the World Cup. Because for the biggest sporting event in the world, it's surprisingly difficult to make any money. Even the most successful World Cup will leave the country in the hole, 
because they don't get much of the money from the biggest money makers of the World Cup. Who does? Let's meet the big man. This is FIFA, the French-named Fédération Internationale de Football Association, a massive international governing body covering multiple types of soccer, or football for everyone but the US. It was founded in 1904 and now has 211 national associations divided between six regional confederations reflecting the continents. They organize the World Cup, they choose who gets it every four years, and they make sure that the country's efforts are up to their standards, and in exchange, they take most of the profits. The World Cup makes its money primarily by three revenue streams, ticket sales for in-person matches, broadcasting rights for the billions of people watching it at home, and advertising rights at matches, which gives advertisers the biggest platform in the world. And all three of these revenue streams go directly back to FIFA, making the host countries attempt to raise money through… concession sales? Well, it's a little more complicated than that, but countries usually try to harness the power of local tourism to offset the costs. FIFA does help to pick up the tab, but not even close to entirely. The money that FIFA provides to the host countries will vary, with FIFA providing just under $2 billion to Qatar for their World Cup. That included close to half a billion that would go to the winning teams in prize money, which makes the funding Qatar receives less than a single percent of the total spending of the event. However, for the other countries, it might easily be around 50% of the total spending, which is helpful, but still puts them in the hole. World Cups usually bring in close to $5 billion in revenue for FIFA, which makes it a win for the organization but not necessarily for the home country. But at least FIFA is an honest broker, right? Hold up, because everything World Cup related has to go through FIFA, and that's an increasingly dicey prospect. FIFA has been getting larger and larger since it was founded in 1904 to govern European football games, and now it's a massive organization, and the larger something is, the easier it is for corruption to sneak in under the radar. The organization used to alternate hosts between Europe and South America, but in 2002 held its first World Cup in Asia and its first in Africa in 2010. Now, any member country can host a World Cup and countries that are interested submit bids which are voted on by FIFA's council. But it turns out that not everything is this simple. In 2015, a massive scandal broke around the world as US federal prosecutors revealed a massive corruption conspiracy climbing up to the highest levels of FIFA. 14 people were indicted over charges including wire fraud, racketeering, and money laundering. And there had been prior guilty pleas. It turned out that there had been massive collusion involving several major soccer organizations to trade influence and divide up events. It was already a major scandal. And then, seven current FIFA officials were arrested in Switzerland on charges of receiving $150 million in bribes. The investigation spread around the world and led to then-current FIFA head Sepp Blatter being removed from office and barred from FIFA activities for eight years. While he was cleared of any criminal charges, it was the biggest disgrace in FIFA history. So, have they cleaned up their act since? It depends on who you ask. FIFA denies there was any bribery going on in the current administration and that all World Cup bids are approved based on their merits. But companies that bid are told how to win FIFA's favor, and it normally involves a commitment to heavy investment. The richer a country is, the easier a time they'll have with this. In the aftermath of the controversy, FIFA appointed an independent ethics advisor who looked at the bids and checked into bribery allegations and cleared Russia's 2018 bid of any wrongdoing. However, many people argued that the report was incomplete, and there was still a lot of doubt around the process. Those doubts would only increase in 2022. So how did Qatar get the World Cup exactly? Many candidates dropped out because of all the negatives, and that cleared the path. The small kingdom lobbied heavily and the oil-rich nation was willing to massively invest in the infrastructure required for the event, but that still left many logistics issues to figure out along the way. It was an odd selection that left many scratching their heads, and in 2020 a whistleblower from Australia published a book that confirmed the suspicions around why FIFA picked Qatar. Bonita Merciades, who spearheaded Australia's own bid for the 2022 World Cup, claimed that Qatar-based Al Jazeera offered a bribe of $100 million for Qatar to secure the cup, and that it was approved by a major FIFA executive who was later expelled for corruption. Later leaked documents refuted the $100 million price tag. It was reportedly $400 million. However, the documents couldn't be fully authenticated and an investigation is ongoing while the preparation for the World Cup continues. But not everyone will be attending. Organizing a World Cup has become trickier than ever before, and hosting dozens of clubs on your soil can be a balancing act, sometimes a dangerous one too. And this is more true in 2022 than ever before. 
There's always the chance of two countries with a nasty political beef facing off and forcing a forfeit when one refuses to play. This is common in other sports, where athletes from countries like Iran are paired against Israeli athletes and refuse to compete. This isn't likely to happen on the big stage, neither Iran nor Israel are global powerhouses in soccer, nor are the other nations that refuse to recognize Israel. But the world hasn't become more peaceful since the last World Cup. After a 2018 World Cup in Russia, you'd think everyone would be glad to be out of there. After all, Russia is notorious for arresting tourists and even famous athletes who come to the country on often sketchy charges. But then came the invasion of Ukraine in early 2022, and soon Russia's very presence in the event was a firestorm. Many people called for Russia to be banned entirely from sporting events, while others said it wasn't fair to punish the individual athletes. FIFA tried to find a middle ground and banned any official matches from being played in Russia, only for teams from several European nations to say they wouldn't compete against Russia. Facing a massive storm, FIFA eventually decided to ban Russia from the World Cup entirely, leading many to call this a hypocrisy because countries like Iran and Saudi Arabia were allowed to compete despite their massive human rights violations. Oh, and of course, there is the home country, Qatar's having a bumpy ride of its own as it tries to get ready to host the cup, including Paris and other French cities around the world boycotting the broadcast in protest of the human rights violations taking place in Qatar. While local French soccer fans will likely be able to get a hold of their favorite sports big matches via streaming, it's another massive black eye for FIFA that the organization definitely doesn't need. So why couldn't they get anyone else to take over? For one thing, once contracts are signed, there would be years of legal wrangling if Qatar had the World Cup taken away late in the process. Much of the infrastructure was already built when the controversy ramped up, and it would cast a cloud over the entire proceedings. And few countries would be able to take over on such short notice unless they already had the infrastructure ready from a previous World Cup. And obviously, the previous 2018 host was flat out for a lot of reasons. Even if they took the event from Qatar, they might not be able to find another host because many rich countries have learned that hosting such a big event is not worth it from another global sporting phenomenon. It used to be that the Olympics were the most prestigious sporting event in the world, as the Global Games took over a major city for several weeks and brought the world together to watch dozens of events every two years between the summer and winter events. But now, the bidding process has been taken over by allegations of money trading. The events have been plagued by accusations that they coddle human rights abusing nations, and the cities that host are often left deeply in debt, just like the World Cup. But in terms of infrastructure, the hit that countries hosting the Olympic stake is often bigger. This event requires a massive structure called an Olympic village be built. It can lead to the expulsion of countless buildings and their residents, and when the games are done, it just sits there. There's no real use for an Olympic village after the games, and the Olympics certainly aren't coming back anytime soon so the cities are left to try to figure out what the heck to do with it. So is there any way to win back the crowd? FIFA and the Olympics both need willing host cities. Some have said that the Olympics should commit to the permanent host cities, maybe Athens, in a tribute to the game's origins. But FIFA is trickier, as the organization has so many members and interests. So experts have discussed how they can make hosting the World Cup more appealing again. And it all comes down to the fact that the event really isn't about the host city anymore. In fact, it often feels like the host city is paying for the privilege to host a massive event that doesn't really benefit them. And to focus on local issues might just save FIFA. Right now, the bids are submitted by countries that pick a city to host. But the actual people in the city often have very little say. This means the city gets a huge federal infrastructure project that leaves them with less living space, more cramped quarters, and a bunch of unwanted guests. Some cities want to boost their profile by hosting an event, especially if they're not a city that's a household name like in the case of Lake Placid hosting the Olympics. But that boost doesn't usually last, ideally picking cities with already massive soccer stadiums and providing money for upgrades might be the safest move, but that would limit the number of cities and countries that could host the World Cup. But would that necessarily be a bad thing? If the Qatar and Russia World Cups, both first-time hosts, have taught FIFA anything, it's that sometimes a World Cup just doesn't belong in a country that isn't a soccer nation. Not only does it not have the infrastructure needed for such an event, especially obvious in Qatar's case, but it might not have the fan base needed to support it. On the other hand, if a FIFA World Cup host has a huge soccer market like Brazil or France, the odds are those massive stadiums would still find use after the event. After all, a stadium filled up to 50% capacity isn't great, but it's a lot better than 10%. And then there's the big elephant in the room. A country or city might want to host the World Cup, but does its people? You'll often see people in major cities protesting against new developments because they think it'll make the city overcrowded or bring in a different element that won't fit in. 
These people are often called NIMBYs, standing for not in my backyard, and they can make building even a new apartment building a Herculean task. A massive soccer stadium and associated buildings has a far larger infrastructure impact on a city, and concerns are larger and pull in even people who may usually be development friendly. As awareness of this impact gets more widespread, cities could find their World Cup bids stopped in their tracks by angry protesters. So how can FIFA fix this problem and get more cities and countries back in the game? The answer might be rather counterintuitive to a massive organization. They might need to be willing to make a little less money. FIFA makes several billion dollars from every World Cup, primarily from ticket sales, advertising, and broadcast rights. Offering a profit-sharing arrangement to willing hosts might make prominent countries more willing to invest in new infrastructure. Also, scheduling smaller tournaments over the years in places that have previously hosted a World Cup might keep the revenue stream flowing rather than leaving those giant stadiums vacant. But could an Olympic solution work for the World Cup? Conversations have centered around making a permanent home for the Olympics, but that's trickier with FIFA. Only a few countries have hosted the World Cup more than once – Brazil, Italy, France, and Mexico. Germany is included if you count East and West Germany as the same country. Additionally, in recent years, FIFA has started splitting hosting duties between neighboring countries. Japan and South Korea jointly hosted in 2002, and the 2026 World Cup will be hosted by the trio of the United States, Mexico, and Canada. While finding a single home for the World Cup won't be nearly as easy as it might be for the Olympics, it's clear that some countries are far more up to the task than others, and a heavy FIFA investment in them could avoid any future boondoggles. But does this hint at a bigger problem for FIFA? The process of selecting host cities has clearly gotten out of control, with accusations of corruption spinning into international criminal conspiracies. But despite that, interest in the World Cup is as strong as ever. Will Qatar see the same level of attendance of past World Cups? We'll see. But if not, it's Qatar who will be seen as a cautionary tale, not FIFA. FIFA will likely see the same massive viewership numbers around the world as millions of soccer fans breathlessly watch to see who hoists the trophy. And that means ultimately FIFA will be able to find a place to host its World Cup, even if they might have to change their business model to make it worth it to a host nation. Want to know more about FIFA's dirty little secrets? Check out How Much Does the World Cup Cost for a more in-depth look, or watch Soccer Player Killed for Scoring a Goal for one of the sport's darkest days.